Welcome to the Real News Network. I'm Sharmini Pires coming to you from Baltimore. What started off as a financial crisis in Europe has now turned and become a crisis of the Eurozone. There has been unprecedented wave of mass strikes signifying the discontent of the working classes. In Greece, for example, people elected the leftist Syriza party and voted no to austerity, dead deal offered to them by the Troika. In France, there has been consistent strikes against efforts to reverse labor rights by the so-called socialist government. Among other interesting developments, in Portugal, the people elected a socialist party which vowed to curb EU austerity. In the UK, they voted for Brexit. Some claim that this was due to the anti-democratic neoliberal structures of the European Union. So what exactly are the limits of the European project and how does the left seize the moment to build a popular movement of the left across the continent? Joining us now to discuss all of this is Katerina Principe. She's the co-editor along with Bashkar Sankara of a new book, Europe in Revolt. She's a social movement activist from Portugal and she's a member of Bloco de Carreda in Portugal and De Linke in Germany and a consulting editor for Jacobin. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you. So uh, let's begin with the very topic of your book and uh, Europe in Revolt. So what are the uh, indicators uh, that you see across the continent that Europe is in revolt and what is breathing beneath it all that gives way to a leftist uh, popular movement? Uh, so first of all, thank you for inviting me here. Um, well, I think the book is called Europe in Revolt because we have witnessed over the last decade, maybe a little bit more, um, we have witnessed movements and new parties, new party formations that reveal the restructuring of the left since the end of the 80s, 90s in Europe. So that is a very interesting experience, and that's what the book tries to cover. It's all those experiences, the ones that were not so good and that have been problematic, like Citizen in Greece, but also the ones that kind of give us hope, like Podemos in Spain and what is happening in Portugal. Um, and what we think is that um, the, the European project as a whole has, it has always been a neoliberal project, but has been able to disguise itself with a kind of like social um, uh, political project. And that is kind of like cracking up, especially since last year when Syriza tried to negotiate to end austerity and the threat imposed by the, by the European Union clearly uh, demolished it. So what we see today in Europe is a sort of a polarization of politics. So in a, we have the growth of the far right, as we know, for example, in Britain. Um, but we also have the growth of the far left. And so in that sense, Europe is in revolt because there's a term oil that we don't know exactly where it's going to end. So this book is, tries to be a contribution to understand the development of the left in the last years. And do you see that this uh, revolt has a transcontinental nature to it? Um, yes and no. Um, so I think it does in the sense of um, a lot of it are questions that have to do with the way that the European Union has been structured for the last decades and, um, and the limitations that the European Union imposes. So if we're looking, for example, at Southern Europe, the similarities are very big. So entering the European Union for us has meant the destruction of our productive sector over dependency on the core countries like Germany or France. Um, and that has uh, forced us to take, for example, huge amount of debt, uh, that now has been like forced into us to pay off very quickly with very high interest rates. And that's how the crisis in Southern Europe have developed. So for sure in Southern Europe, there are very strong similarities with the imposition of austerity policies also. In the core, it's a bit different because the, the positions between, for example, Germany or Portugal are very different in the, in the, in the structured economy of the European Union. So I would say, yes, there are similarities. So there is a certain like transnational feeling to it because it is this transnational feeling comes from the, the chains and the bounds that the European Union has imposed to us. But at the same time, they have a very specific national uh, phenomena and dynamics. And the reason I ask about the transcontinental nature of this is because neoliberalism and the European 
uh, Union's austerity measures are applied transcontinentally, and therefore the revolt against it must also be transcontinental. And people looked, you know, people were watching Greece very carefully. And now that Brexit has actually passed, uh, you know, Greece, uh, people in Greece are looking at it going, wow, you know, they could do it, we can do it. Um, is that that kind of sensibility around the uh, continent? Um, I think, uh, so two things. First, I think the European Union is not, so the, the European Union is for sure a transnational project, but it's a transnational process, a, a pro, a pro, sorry, project that is composed by competing nation states. So the, the importance of the nation state in the way this process is in itself composed, so the competition between core periphery countries or the fact that the periphery countries have transformed their productive sectors into sectors of non-tradable goods in order to import what the core countries are producing so that they can export. So this, this tension between core periphery in Europe is very clear. So it is a transnational block, but composed by competing nation states. So it's not only a transnational block, and that's what makes it different, these two levels. And Brexit, uh, is, it's a very interesting development on European politics. Um, we have to, I think, my opinion is we have to be a little bit careful about it, because on the one hand, it does open a space, but the way that the campaign was drawn, like the left wasn't able to capitalize on the discontent. And I think a lot of the discontent that showed that people showed by voting leave has not to do with racism or xenophobia. It has to do with the fact that actually neoliberal policies that are imposed by the European Union have torn apart people's lives, have thrown people into unemployment and poverty. Uh, but the fact also is that the right was able to capitalize on this, on, this, on this discontent and the left wasn't. So I think we have to be careful on the way we approach what is happening in, in, in the UK right now. And uh, w a lot of the uh, discussion around Brexit as, uh, was uh, about how the youth feel this affinity with the European Union because they feel that they must uh, have the freedom to move about the, co uh, the continent and they like that. Uh, so, the, so a lot of young people, uh, it was framed as if this was the preference of the young, was it? I can't really say. I mean, I think there is a, for sure, a class dynamic happened in the referendum. So tendentially more working class people voted for leave. The reasons why are very different, I think. Um, I think the more educated, um, the more educated urban class, younger people voted for remain. And um, I think it is true that um, the discourse, the narrative of European integration, the European process that I grew up with. I grew up in, in the year, I grew up in 86, the year that Portugal joined the European Union. So of course, this is part of the way that my identi identity was framed. So it is the idea that we can travel, that we can um, do Erasmus and like go to other universities across the continent, don't have to ask for visas, can migrant, migrate easily. Uh, that is for sure something that we grew up with and people are afraid of losing that possibility of uh, movement, which is a good thing. Um, but I think the reasons why people voted for Leave or Remain are a bit more complicated than just that. Yeah. The labor mobility is a, is a big factor, uh, particularly for the youth, because they want to be able to go to other countries and work for the summers and come back home and go to university and, and so on. Um, however, you're, you're saying you know, this is a much more complicated issue than just that. Um, what are the options available? I mean, one doesn't have to have the Eurozone in order to mediate and manage all of this mobility of labor across uh, nation states. Uh, there, it's, it was possible before I and mean, could, could, could be eased and could be loosened up. If that issue was dealt with, for example, uh, would they make the same kind of choice? Probably not. I think um, the, 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 the clear, the, the clear um, uh, fact that the EU is not purely a transnational bloc is that the nation state structures and the borders are still at place, right? So it would be possible to imagine a united Europe 
that is a sort of a federation of different states that are, you know, left wing from below, democratic, really democratic, where people actually can control uh, uh, the economy and the way that the states and their life is structured. Um, but that's not the European Union. So um, it would be possible to have open borders, open borders from within and and also for everyone else that is coming from outside of Europe. And I think that would answer to what a lot of young people that voted for Remain because of the border question. That would be a much serious answer to that. Um, but that seems a bit more far away than um, what is possible today. Let's take a look at France. Um, in the last four months, we've seen a great deal of labor unrest uh, with Hollande, the socialist uh, <laughs> party uh, of uh, France, imposing by decree uh, all these uh, rolling back of labor rights uh, in France. And there's been mounting discontent and a movement growing. Um, how, how strong is those uh, protests? They're very strong. They're probably some of the stronger protests we've seen in France in the last many years. Um, and that is, uh, I think there's two very amazing things. So on the one hand is that it is a sort of like, it's reclaiming against this feeling and this flair from the acampadas, from the people that occupy the squares, like a little bit like Occupy here. Also, there's some connections to that. But at the same time, uh, we see a very clear intervention of the trade unions. And the trade unions trying to like bring and the, the movement and the trade unions trying to work together. And that is a very interesting experience. Uh, and it's, it's not been a common thing um, in Europe. Uh, it's been difficult to navigate this space between the unions and the movements. So I think that is a very good qualitative, qualitative jump in what is happening. How long will this last? Now, it is clear mm -hmm. that, uh, that uh, each of the unions that are protesting at this time um, the the pilots, uh, the teachers, the train workers, and so on. Are each of them are being dealt with by the Hollande government in terms of negotiation? So, uh, projecting ahead, I see one by one being taken out of the protesting mode. Um, what are the uh, projections here, uh, particularly given that the now the motion has passed? Um, I know there's a few more steps in putting it into law, but the main union organizing. This has said, uh, you know, uh, the, the law might have passed, but our protest will remain into uh, a reorganized um, intensity uh, coming up in the fall. Um, I, I, I cannot give a clear answer to that. I think it will also rely on the... Um, and I, that's why I, I also said that this quality of, like, having the movements and the unions together, mm -hmm. that is... Even if the government may be able to negotiate with some sectorial trade unions on some deals, mm -hmm. if there is a movement that is bringing all these people together, that is occupying the streets, that is working together with the unions, mm -hmm. then that might be the, um, the air the, the, that, it, that this movement needs to go on if they manage to keep on fighting together. Um, but I, can, I cannot say exactly what, how things will develop in the fall now. And um, are other uh, states looking at this uh, situation in France as a uh, inspirational uh, assertion of the working classes and unions and student movements together as something that they could take away from and, and formulate? Well, I sure hope so. <laughs> I mean, it has been a discussion for many years about, um, in Portugal also very much so, uh, because we have a very, very high number of precarious workers. It's basically maybe now more than the half of the Portuguese working population. And our question has been for years, how do we revitalize the labor movement under so difficult circumstances of organizing when collective bargaining is disappearing? Mm -hmm. So I hope that Nuit Debout and all this experience in France can be kind of an inspiring moment to, for us also to realize how we can bring those topics together and take the different social actors together in a stronger and more um, organized uh, movement. Um, all the protests uh, in France and Greece and other places has had very little impact on the leadership of the European Union. And uh, they are treading along as if uh, there uh, has nothing has happened here. Um, how stable is the Eurozone? Um, 
So I would like to say, I would like to put up an argument that um, I think it's interesting about what is also going on. I think we can't look at the um, European elite um, and the ruling class of the European Union as a very, as an homogenous subject. I think they have been ha there's been uh, clashes among them also, and this is very clear when you see what's happening with um, parties of the Socialist International, so the PS, the the Socialist um, Party of France, the Socialist Party of Portugal, PASOK in Greece that completely disappeared, the SPD in Germany, because during the last decades they have basically turned themselves into social liberal parties and basically picked up. They have no differentiation, clear differentiation from the right-wing agenda. They are just by, they are just disappearing from the polls, um, and that's been happening in Europe for the last years. And so I think there is sort of an opening of a space right now uh, that I think aims to like restructure and revive these parties that are a very important political group and political family in the constitution of the European ruling class. Um, so, for example, in Portugal. Um, the kind of the maneuvering space that the Portuguese Socialist Party has been given in to negotiate to its left, so to form a government supported by the, 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 left, the left bloc bloco and the Communist Party, has also to do with this idea that they need to tackle the left in order to restructure themselves and, and survive the political crisis that they've been going through. And this is very clear when you see the different positions that sometimes the European leaders take. For example, Schäuble, which is part of the conservative group, mm -hmm. is much harsher on what should happen, while, for example, Schulz, which is part of the, the other political family, tries to maneuver things. Um, so I think definitely the European Union as a structure is in crisis. Brexit has accelerated it. We don't know exactly what's going to happen, and there can be contradictory phenomena. And it's also in crisis because its leading figures or its, its elites are also in crisis. They don't know exactly how to deal with this. Um, so we've just known a couple of days ago that Portugal, for example, is going to have to pay sanctions uh, for um, overcoming the deficit limits, um, which is very interesting because that's going to be bad for the Socialist Party and it's of Portugal, so they are leading the government. And we don't know how exactly they're going to tackle that. So they say they're against the sanctions, but now the pressure has been applied for them to keep on the good, like Schäuble said, the good austerity road, right? So we don't know exactly how this is going to play out in the next times. I want to take up Portugal yes. in our next segment, oh, but before okay. <laughs> before we do that, um, because I think people need a little bit more context to Portugal mm -hmm. to understand what's going on there at the moment. But before we do that, I want to uh, readdress this issue about the leadership crises. Mm -hmm. um, so when you look at uh, Greece and you look at Syriza, and uh, uh, we we saw Syriza's leadership fall apart and uh, split into uh, another organization. And, and now we have a number of other parties on the left, but also um, popular unity. Uh, in uh, France, uh, we know that the socialist government of Hollande is now in crisis um, as a result of this very um, law that it, they're trying to pass in, uh, uh, in the government, the left, leftists of the socialist party are seriously objecting it to this, uh, which might put Hollande himself into a leadership crisis. Uh, we are seeing this happening in, in as a result of the Brexit vote, uh, both on the conservative side as well as uh, it, uh, on the Labour side in the UK. Um, uh, what are the um, sentiments in terms of the popular movements that are out there and you're seeing these kinds of splits. Are you to seize the moment, uh, for example, in terms of supporting mm -hmm. Corbyn, or do you say, no, these parties have already abdicated their uh, right to govern from a left perspective like Syriza and formulate your own like popular unity? Um, <laughs> that is a, I, I, I don't know if there is one answer. I don't think there is one answer to that because the, the situations are very different from one another. And I think that's also what, that's also what the book tries to uh, propose. It's a differentiated, although there's a common thread uh, that organizes the different pieces on the book, there's um, differences. So um, I think Corbyn is definitely a moment that the left needs to seize right now. I think uh, that the PSF in France is a completely different story. The PSF is 
not doesn't have a left-wing leadership that suddenly won the party and is like able to mobilize a left-wing fringe of the population into the party that is trying to dispute it as Corbyn. Syriza is again a different story because it is a one uh, under a very clear anti-austerity uh, program that they themselves were not able or and did not want to fulfill for different reasons. I don't want to go into detail this discussion. Um, so of course that creates also different crises. Um, so I think there is a moment, there is an opening of a moment to rebuild an anti-austerity left. And I think that anti-austerity left has to have a clear, very clear critical perspective on the European Union, which is not, for example, what Syriza did. I think it has to be very clear and very objective about the limitations of the European project. It has to be aware that probably the only way to stop austerity is by disobeying is by disobeying the European dictates because they're undemocratic and they're neoliberal and they will try everything to stop any form of government movement that is actually to the left and that is reclaiming labor rights and social rights. And I think that that has to be done by um, not building campaigns on like, let's leave the Euro or let's leave the Eurozone or let's leave the European Union because that is very unpopular and people are very afraid of that. But I think that movement must be built on the questions and the demands that we know are fundamental to revert austerity. For example, restructuring of the public debts of southern European countries. For example, nationalization or renationalization of the strategic sectors of the economy, the railroad in, in the UK, for example, or the electricity in, uh, um, in Portugal, um, and also a public control of the banking system. These three things which the left finds fundamental for reverting austerity cannot be done within the European Union today. Um, and I think that is kind of like, the if you ask me, this is what I put forward, is like this is the strategic line upon which the left must build um, because um, only a movement that confronts in practice the limitations of the European Union will stop being afraid of leaving if it needs to be. Katarina, thank you so much for joining us today. And thank you for joining us on The Real News Network. Mm -hmm.